This is Jocko Podcast number 130. With Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Caesar, when he perceived that the seventh legion, which stood close by him, was also hard pressed by the enemy, directed the tribunes of the soldiers to effect a junction of the legions gradually and make their charge upon the enemy with a double front which having been done since they brought assistance to the one to the other, nor feared lest their rear should be surrounded by the enemy, they began to stand their ground more boldly and to fight more courageously. In the meantime, the soldiers of the two legions, which had been in the rear of the army as a guard for the baggage train, upon the battle being reported to them, quickened their pace and were seen by the enemy on top of the hill. And Titus, having gained possession of the camp of the enemy and observed from higher ground what was going on in our camp, sent the 10th legion as a relief to our men, who, when they had learned from the flight of the horses and the sutlers in what position the affair was and in how great danger the camp and the legion and the commander were involved, left undone nothing to dispatch. By their arrival, so great a change of matters was made that our men, even those who had fallen down, exhausted with wounds, leaned on their shields and renewed the fight. Then the camp retainers, though unarmed, seeing the enemy completely dismayed, attacked them though they were armed. The horsemen, too, that they might, by their valor, blot the disgrace of their flight, thrust themselves before the legionary soldiers in all parts of the battle. But the enemy, even in the last hope of safety, displayed such great courage that when the foremost of them had fallen, the next stood upon those who were prostrate and fought from on top of their bodies. When these were overthrown and their corpses heaped up together, those who survived cast their weapons against our men as from a mound and returned our darts which, which had fallen short between our armies so that it ought not to be concluded that men of such great courage had injudiciously dared to pass a very broad river, ascend very high banks, and come to a very disadvantageous place, since their greatness of spirit had rendered these actions easy, although in themselves very difficult. So, War is eternal, and some things do not change. And in war, we see the brutal examples of savagery, and we also see the courage and sacrifice that's hard to find anywhere else. Like in that passage right there, unarmed men attacking the enemy. And even the enemy showing courage, climbing on top of stacked bodies of their brethren to gain a little bit of high ground. Think about that, gaining the high ground by climbing on the backs of your fallen comrades. Now, that is war, and that account of war is from the book the Gallic Wars, which was written by Julius Caesar himself, although he refers to himself in the third person. And that war lasted from around 58 BC to 50 BC, eight years of fighting between the Gauls, who were a Celtic race of people in what is now France and Belgium. I guess you'd say Celtic. And of course, the Romans were known for their military strength and in the future, 
I'm sure we'll go a little bit deeper into some of Caesar's writing. But today we're going to look more at an overall assessment and instruction, really, about the Roman legions, which, as I said, are known as an incredibly powerful military fighting force that conquered much of Europe and parts of Africa and the Middle East over time. And the writing that we're looking at today comes from a guy by the name of Vegetius. Now, his full name was Publius Flavius Vegetius Renatus. But thankfully, we can just refer to him as Vegetius. Not much is known about him. It's actually not even known 100% if Vegetius was actually in the military. It, it seems as if he was, and even if he was, it's likely that he didn't have any great stature or rank inside the Roman military. But he did capture some incredibly important information. And he called it the Epidemo Re Militaris, which translates basically into the epitome of the art of war. Sometimes it's also called De Re Militaria, which means on matters of the military. And the book is estimated to have been written around 430 AD, so it's several hundred years after Caesar's reign. But this book that he wrote became a guide for warfare throughout the Middle Ages. And, and interestingly, this is even, it stayed even after we had gunpowder. And it was carried oftentimes by general officers and their staff throughout Europe. And there are even reports that George Washington carried an annotated copy with him, which, as I dug into it, may or may not be completely true. But at a minimum, at a minimum, he paraphrased Vegetius's book in his first address to Congress in 1790 when he said to be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving peace. So, Vegetius put this information together through, at a minimum, keen observation of how the Roman legions and the Roman military worked. And the book has stood the test of time, so I think we might as well see what we can get out of it. Yes, sir. What do you think? Yes, sir. Agree? Agree? Check. It starts off strong we'll say that (laughs) starts off right here victory in war does not depend entirely upon numbers or mere courage only skill and discipline will ensure it that's a common theme Mm -hmm. we find that the Romans owed the conquest of the world to no other cause than their continual military training, exact observance of discipline in their camps, and unwearied cultivation of other arts of war. Does this mean I'm just going to be talking about discipline for the next, as long as I'm alive? Yes. It's, it's entirely possible, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that he says it's, it's important than just mere, more important than just mere courage. Right. Like courage is important, mm. but there's something more important: discipline. Yes, and skill. And skill, skill. You like that part? Yes. Okay. Romans. Okay, they thoroughly understood the importance of hardening them. So he's talking about what the Romans. He's talking about the Romans. That's the they. They thoroughly understood the importance of hardening them by continual practice and of training them to every maneuver that might happen in the line and in action. Nor were they less strict in punishing idleness and sloth. <laughs> See, sometimes I stick up for like our generation or being modern. Mm-hmm. Saying like, no, you know, we're we're kind of hardcore too, sure. but then I read stuff like that and I kind of wonder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wonder. Yeah. The courage of a soldier is heightened 
by his knowledge of his profession and he only wants an opportunity to execute what is he is convinced he has been perfectly taught so that makes sense I did an interview a little while ago and as he hasn't come out yet it was with NPR mm-hmm. NPR mm-hmm. National Public Radio mm-hmm. but he was asking me he had heard me say in an interview that like I wanted to go to war and he was kind of surprised about that but that's exactly what this is talking about mm-hmm. you train and you're convinced that you've been taught well and then you want to go get after it especially when you're young yeah <laughs> and you have nothing to lose back to the book a handful of men inured to war proceed to certain victory while on the contrary numerous armies of raw and undisciplined troops are but multitudes of men dragged to the slaughter No big deal. Yeah. Multitudes of undisciplined men, you're just getting dragged to the slaughter. That's life. That's life. Oh, and here's another point. For it is certain that the less a man is acquainted with the sweets of life, the less reason he has to be afraid of death. It's interesting. Mm. The young soldier, therefore, ought to have a lively eye. Oh, this is, he's just talking about what what the young recruits should be like what kind of qualities they're supposed to have the young soldier therefore ought to have a lively eye should carry his head erect his chest and shoulders be broad his shoulders muscular and brawny his fingers long his arms strong and his waist small going back to posture mm-hmm. remember I brought that up with Jordan B Peterson yes He's got that chapter in his book, Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back. And I'm like, that's how you get indoctrinated in the military. Yeah. That's been going on since the Roman times. Yeah. There's something to it. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> Talking more about the recruits, he says, they should be taught the use of their arms by constant and daily exercise. But this essential custom has long been abolished by the relaxation introduced by a long peace. <sighs> Can't accept that when things get easy. And you know... Again, working with businesses all the time, it's it's real easy when the times are good, like the economy's good. Right now, the economy's good, right? Mm-hmm. So people are just kind of making money and everything is good, yeah. and they don't train as hard, they don't prepare as much. Yeah. Happens in everything. Yeah, because we kind of subconscious, well, it seems like in any way, subconsciously rely on that kind of push. Like the, you know, the st- stress will push you, you know. Like if the economy's not good, it's like oh, it kind of pushes you to like oh, we gotta for sure. go to work or whatever, and it kind of okay. Goes do everything. you you know how some people? I think you actually do this. Some people perform better under pressure. Yeah. The reason I say you because you'll you'll have a video to make, let's say, uh-huh. and if there's no deadline, let's just say there's no real <laughs> there's no real urgency. hope or urgency. <laughs> sure. Like I'm not a, I'm not I'm not expecting to see that. But then sometimes there's a deadline, like for a muster video. Yeah. And and there comes the deadline, and boom, there's the video. Yeah, midnight, one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, into my email. Yeah, you need that. You need that structure and discipline, young it man. Does, it does help. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, hundred percent. Yeah, even even time stuff. Like if you're like, hey, meet me at around seven, bro. Um, that's uh, not you good. Know, yeah, well, it'll be more. It'll be around whatever time. You might as well have said show up when you want. Yeah, but I rolled if, the dice a little bit today because I said twelve thirty ish did you notice that yes to me when you put a number that's, i just assume that's the number yeah yeah that's how that's just how yeah that's probably good yeah <laughs> you're right i think you're right you're right i think yeah you, you do you do pretty good with being on time for me actually yeah yeah well i'm gonna yeah. say you're batting a pretty good average yeah, yeah that's true <laughs> did you see someone asked how they could get your job yes yeah yeah, and I told him to kill me, kill you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, there you go. I guess we know now. now. You got there the, you go. the price on your head. <laughs> yep. Someone else, maybe they can be on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's because really that's all it requires. Press record, be on time. There you go. Boom. Easy Boom. money. <laughs> all right. Now he's talking a little bit about initial training. Going back to the book, the first thing the soldiers are to be taught. Is the military step which can only be acquired by constant practice of marching quick and together nor is anything of more consequence either on the march or in the line than they should keep 
their ranks with the greatest exactness for troops who march in irregular and disorderly manner are always in great danger of being defeated and I, I read that part so I could read this part they should march with the common military step 20 miles in five summer hours and with full step which is quicker 24 miles in the same number of hours so these guys can march these guys can march and we've talked a lot about foot patrols and in the it, it's in the SEAL teams there's something called a forced march yeah which is like you're on a road there's no threat you're just marching yeah and you're trying to move from point A to point B don't do a lot of that in the SEAL teams you don't even do really much in the well I can't say that but there's a difference that's a forced march we called it a forced road march mm-hmm. and then there's patrolling where you're tactical and you're scanning your field of fire mm. these guys are talking about a forced road march you're just on the road it's basically you're you're going as fast as you can so That's you're it's just like maybe you're, what you don't have a ride or something. I mean in your case yeah yeah, yeah. wouldn't have a ride for whatever reason mm. well in the SEAL teams we usually had a ride that's, right. that's, that's why, why you don't do as yeah, much, that's why don't do yeah, as much. It. gotcha oh here's a good one learn to swim every young soldier without exception should in the summer months be taught to swim for it is sometimes impossible to pass rivers on bridges but the flying and pursuing army both are often obliged to swim over them a sudden melting of snow or fall of rain often makes them overflow their banks and in such a situation the danger is as great from ignorance in swimming as from the enemy it's I kind of take it for granted that people know how to swim but yeah. it is not true and yeah. when I figured that out when I went to Navy boot camp because you'd think if you were joining the Navy, Navy yeah. you'd know how to swim yeah no not true yeah not true at all people did yeah. not know a decent amount of people did not know how to swim yeah I'm with you I'm shoot I come from Kauai where you know everyone knows how to swim yeah even at like two years old yeah people, you know you know how to swim because you're on the island yeah and it's all <laughs> but yeah man there's people yeah straight up some people haven't even seen the water you know, like the ocean or whatever. Well, there's definitely people that haven't seen the ocean. Yeah. I mean, when I went to when I went to SEAL training, there was guys that had never been to the ocean before. Yeah, they that's were from I mean. Iowa. Yeah. You know, no, they just salt. Why does the water taste salty? Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, parents teach your kids how to swim. They have those good programs now where they do the little floating program, so like even a little baby can float themselves and stuff. But you can look that up on YouTube and learn how to teach your your like baby to swim yeah it's and be incredibly careful. effective yeah be i'm careful. throwing the Please. uh what's that called the safety tip. yeah the safety tip mm-hmm. yeah that's that's you gotta you know when you're doing anything in the water you, you gotta be careful really careful yeah. even when you're training in the water you gotta be really careful one up one down is the rule like if one person's doing some training someone's got to stand there and watch them mm. to make sure that they're safe yeah but yeah if you don't know how to swim learn how to swim back to the book no state can either be happy or secure that is remiss and negligent in the discipline of its troops <laughs> for it is not profusion of riches or excess of luxury that can influence our enemies to court our, or respect us this can only be affected by the terror of our arms It is an observation of Cato that misconduct in the common affairs of life may be retrieved, but that it is quite otherwise in war, where errors are fatal and without remedy, and are followed by immediate punishment. For the consequences of engaging an enemy without skill or courage is that part of the army is left on the field of battle, and those who remain receive such an impression from their defeat that they dare not afterwards look the enemy in the face." powerful stuff right there this can only be affected by the terror of our arms mm-hmm. it's underlying there's a little underlying threats of violence and everything that I shouldn't say everything but they're just there. Almost everything. Oh, let me let me let me break it down a little bit more because uh-huh. I don't want to make a broad statement about the whole world but sure. when I was a young guy in a SEAL platoon there yeah. was definitely underlying threats of violence I mean oh, yeah. even with a big smile on your face even amongst total bros like the the, the thing that's underlying yeah. is like well you know yeah if this if escalates goes down you know, you know <laughs> we know how that could go yeah. <laughs> so yeah have the discipline train <laughs> I, I, 
I don't know why I'm finding this book like almost comical in how just on point it is with everything I think about. I kind of noticed that earlier. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, the whole opening thing, the whole opening, <coughs> the opening onslaught of discipline. <laughs> you know, I was straight up into it. Mm-hmm. So, back to the book. To accustom soldiers to carry burdens is also an essential part of discipline. Recruits in particular should be obliged frequently to carry a weight of not less than 60 pounds exclusive of their arms and to march with it in the ranks. This is because on difficult expeditions, they often find themselves under the necessity of carrying their provisions as well as their arms. Nor will they find this troublesome when inured to it by custom, which makes everything easy. Boom. There you go. Mm. Wear the gear that you're wear the gear that you're going to fight with. Get used to it. Get used to it. I used to, I used to talk about this with like discipline equals freedom. Mm-hmm. The whole idea of it. I'd say if you have the discipline to wear your gear all the time, then you'll have freedom of movement when you need it. Right. You know. And yeah. I, I kind of felt like that was a stretch. Does that seem like a stretch? N- well, no, not anymore. Yeah, I not mean, anymore. Just kind of pull yeah. it back into the non-stretch zone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for for sure. Because like. Yeah, okay, so you have all your gear on, right? And Jody Minnick was kind of talking about this, I think, when he was like, oh, man, you know, like it was just a pain in the ass to wear and all this stuff. That feeling, that's a real feeling. Man, this is a pain, all this gear, this is digging into my, you know, or I'm not used to it or kind of thing. But, man, you get a guy who's really used to it, but that's not even a factor. not even a factor. You know, he's free from that. And it does. There's two things that happens. Number one, you get used to it. Number two, you figure out your gear so that your gear works properly. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, you can... Because because your gear when you first put it on no matter you go to the best Gear store in the world and you buy gear and it's not gonna fit you quite right You have to make little modifications. You have to adjust it. You have to put the weight somewhere else now in football You wouldn't always wear your gear in practice, right? Um, it, it was pretty designated like depending on the day, you know, so you know two days you have full gear You know two days you have just helmets and shoulder pads or whatever But yeah, you were you were oh, what okay. you were supposed to some guys would like Maybe not wear their mouthpiece or something like that, but it, it'd be rare. I think hmm. in the NFL, like they won't wear their thigh pads or their hip. And that's just because it's a pain. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I can't really speak for. I think I know that guys who run a lot, and if you take out your thigh pads and your like hip protectors and stuff, it helps you run hmm. for sure. But you so run that you, risk. Then you should train with it. You should train with it. But here's the thing, though, if. If there's a rule, because some guys, even in the game, they just won't wear it. They just simply won't wear it. But you do run the risk of, like, if you get what's called a hip pointer, there's an injury called a hip pointer. Mm-hmm. It's basically your external obliques. They kind of overlap your hip bone, right? And when a helmet or something hits that and crushes your external oblique against your hip bone, it's called a hip pointer. And it's it's a debilitating, painful Injury the kind of where even in everyday life you're out of the game you're <laughs> out of the game and I've had it before So hip protectors will help against that so you run that risk but, You know so it's up to you man. I mean I think in college. I know in high school. It's a you, it's a rule You mm-hmm. got to wear a hip protector, but um, I think in the NFL you don't have to well That's good. I think the overall point is and it sounds like the football was on board with it train how you fight Yeah, wear the gear train how you fight, but it's tough too though in f- in, and this goes for any contact situation, even obvious and really in the military. But it's it's almost like so obvious in the military that it's a given, where that you can't train exactly how you fight. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, so, you can't shoot each other. Yeah, and the, and exactly right. So it's, like I said, really. I used obvious. to tell guys that I used to be like, hey, unfortunately, I'd you know, I'd be like, <laughs> right. unfortunately, I can't put guys out here to actually kill you and you do yeah, the wrong like, thing. Like you, know? you really but, want yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like Same thing for for football as it turns out, where you can't just. Have guys going live five yeah, days have, a week, you know, so many hit pointers or you'd be, all day. Yeah. yeah, actually. So he goes on to talk about we talks about some slack here going back to the book, but negligence and sloth having by degrees introduced a total relaxation of discipline. The soldiers began to think their armor too heavy as they seldom put it on. They first requested leave from the emperor to lay aside the the cuirass and afterwards the helmet. In consequence of this, our troops in their engagements with the Goths were often overwhelmed with their showers of arrows. So there you go. Start taking that little shortcut. And I like how he says it's by degrees. Mm -hmm. Like no one just wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to be weaker now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm over this whole thing. They just 
start to decay just a little bit. Yeah. Take a little shortcut. Yeah. You know, here's here's a here's a here's a workout. <laughs> a workout tip. Jocko's workout <laughs> tips. I'm sure. serious. This yeah. is a, this is like something that goes through my head. Mm-hmm. When I'm doing some exercise, let's say it's squat day, and let's say it's it's I'm doing the 20 rep squats, which is just painful. Yes. And I have that thought in my head where sometimes, you know, I'll be like, oh, man, you know what? Just I'll just do 16 today. And yeah, that's pretty yeah, good. yeah. Because, you know, like, I mean, I worked really hard yesterday, and I'm kind of tired. And you're still doing And I'm still doing At least I did them. Yeah. And you know what? I'll, you know, blah, 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 blah. And when I hear myself saying that, I always think like that's the be- that's the first step down yep. down the slippery slope to yep. decay, and I'm not gonna do it. Yeah. I'm not gonna do it. Have you ever have you ever skipped it? Come on, be be real. Have, have you ever what? Have you ever skipped it? Like you know those doubts, not doubts, but those those thoughts of hey, let me let me slack. Not skipping oh, workout. I mean, have you ever given the in? only time the only time where I've been like you know what I'm not finishing this workout is like I'll hurt something. Oh, for and, yeah, and that's way different. And and I've done it where. I've done it where I haven't done that. That's a lesson learned. Like I've been, like I remember one time I was squatting and I, I like felt a little, you know, you get a little t- t- twinge in your back. Yeah, yeah. I got one of those and then I kept going and then I was debilitated. I was like, yeah. I was like, not good. But generally, if yeah, no, when I because because it's this. That's why I'm saying this. Like that little conversation right there yeah. is a good conversation to have with yourself because I think about, I think about that little. You just give that little bit of slack that time. And it's not good, yeah. you know. It's like that. Just in my mind, I'm thinking that leads to more, more slack right there. It does. That leads to a little bit more sure slack next not. time, because next time you're gonna feel that way at 15 reps instead of 16. Yeah, because you've est- even if it's subconsciously, you established a new little a, pre- a precedent, which mm. is kind of just the it's standard, okay to just give up. a little bit. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's like it's different if you're undefeated. Right. If you're undefeated, mm-hmm. you're either undefeated or you're not undefeated yeah. kind of thing. Once you're defeated, <laughs> then you're kind of like, mm, okay, you know. Let it sneak in there. Yeah. It's part of you now. Yeah. Ugh. I got to say I'm defeated straight <laughs> up. Oh, my God. You know, the, <laughs> I do the Metcon at the end. You know, I live yeah. and do Metcon. And it's, you know, good. And I, I will I'll say straight up, I'll be honest that it doesn't happen very often. I mean, I, yeah. I talk a lot of trash with her, but it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, there's times where I'll be like, oh, well. That workout was pretty solid. Yeah, was I mean, pretty I'll do. Good. I'll make deals. That with makes myself, me mad. You know? That 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 makes me mad, and I and I, I don't like that. Actually, hanging with you, it made me give, <laughs> gave me that mindset, which is a mindset I simply did not have. Go deathcore on oh, that I, thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know you how you said it makes you mad. Like I never yeah, had yeah, that yeah, feeling. Yeah. Never yeah. had that feeling. Like oh, why does it make me? I just never thought of it that way. Ever like not even a little bit. Didn't even consider thinking it that way. But now, yeah, when I feel it, like oh, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. I really don't feel. I actually have that response where you kind of get mad at it. <laughs> yeah, at yourself, yeah. kind of thing. It's yeah. like you're split into That's two people. That's a positive thing. Actually. It is. It helps. Red helps so much. That's the death core right there. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> Check. All right. Let's see, going back to the book. It was a constant custom among the old Romans to exercise both cavalry and infantry three times a month in by marches of a certain length. The foot were obliged to march completely armed the distance of 10 miles from the camp and return in the most exact order and with the military step which they changed and quickened on some part of the march. They made these marches not in plain and even ground only, but both cavalry and infantry were ordered into difficult and uneven places and to ascend or descend mountains to prepare them for all kinds of accidents and familiarize them with the different maneuvers that various situations of a country may require. These guys put some miles in. Uh, Again, the reason that I, I wanted to mention that part is it's not just it's not just about wearing the gear. It's trying to simulate as closely as you can to the situation that you're going to be in. Mm. Same thing with anything. Same thing with sports. Same thing with business. When you're training someone, <clears throat> when you're training someone for business, put them in that situation that they as close as you can to what they're going to be in. Yeah. Here it continues to enumerate the different nations so formidable of old. All which now are subject to the Romans would be tedious. So he's saying, like, we beat down so many people, we can't, we're not even gonna take the time mm. to talk about them all. 
but the security established by long peace has altered their dispositions drawn them off from military to civil pursuits and infused into them a love of idleness and ease again this guy's writing several hundred years after caesar so he's talking about the you know the the, the slippery slope mm. hence a relaxation of military discipline insensibly ensued then a neglect of it and it sunk at last into entire oblivion so he's watching the fall of the roman empire and where does it start lack of discipline Mm -hmm. with the troops boom (laughs) i'm getting a kick out of this book Mm -hmm. the necessity therefore of discipline cannot be too often inculcated as well as the strict attention requisite in the choice and training of new levies. Don't you can't ever can't ever let up the sock. You can't you can't ever say it's okay not to do that rep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that that's in the book. He goes into a long sort of a long long description of how they were organized, like man by man, troop by troop. Uh, not gonna go too deep into that, you know. Well, one of the things he does mention in that section is is about how when they stopped doing a good job replacing the soldiers that were leaving, you know, you're you're not keeping, you're not keeping people coming in, not keeping them trained up. Mm-hmm. And this is a good thing. I think this is good for any team situation. The expense of keeping up good or bad troops is the same. But it depends wholly on you. So, I think that's a good statement. Mm. You know, you got you got some good members on your team. You got some bad members on the team. It costs you the same to keep them. Yeah. Well, you you got to decide how you're gonna how you're gonna manage that situation. <clears throat> Back to the book. In former times. The discipline was so strict that the tribunes or officers not only caused the troops under their command to be exercised daily in their presence, but were themselves so perfect in their military exercise as to set them by example. Nothing does so much honor to the abilities or application of the tribune as the appearance and discipline of the soldiers. When their apparel is neat and clean, their arms bright and in good order, and when they perform their exercises and evolutions with dexterity. No big deal. More. He's talking about just keeping the elements organized in a combat situation. Lest the soldiers in the confusion of battle should be separated from their comrades, every cohort had its shield painted in a manner peculiar to itself. The name of each soldier was also written on his shield together with the number of the cohort and sentry to which he belonged. I like that. I had a note in here about how we we would name our vehicles so you'd know what vehicle to get into. You know, like the Your Humvees, the yeah, Humvees yeah. would have names. Yeah. So you'd know which vehicle was yours. Was there one called Zev or yeah, something? Yeah, they had all kinds of yeah, yeah. names for them. The, <laughs> my first deployment to Iraq, <laughs> my first deployment to Iraq, they were named after the movie. <coughs> oh, movie. All right. Yeah, they were cool. named after a movie. Legit. It's about bowling, but it's not the Big Lebowski. A kingpin. It was kingpin. Yeah, that was the yeah. name. There Big was, Earn, right? There was one of the Humvees was called Big Earn. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what's interesting yeah. is the Humvees originally were not named. They were numbered. Mm-hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that seems like a pretty squared away. Like, I, Jocko would be good with that. Just to give him a number. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's the problem with it. When you're going on an operation, you go into a building to do a, a, a takedown of a building. Yeah. The vehicles move around. They, they got to adjust. And when you come back out, they might not necessarily be in order numerically. Oh, yeah. So guys, but guys would go one, two, three. Oh, that's my vehicle. Gotcha. So, yeah. so they get in the wrong vehicle, which might not seem like a big deal. But then when you're trying to get a head count and someone's yeah. not in the right vehicle, and the right. vehicle commander's like, I'm, I, I'm supposed to have eight guys and I only have seven. Yeah. Now we're trying sitting on the X trying to get a head count, and that's yeah. problematic. Yeah. But if you know what your name of your vehicle is, 
you confirm it and they're written on the side in nice big letters yeah you're looking for big urn you but, see it you jump in <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense with the yeah. with the numbers because I think just by nature we assign numbers to things for all kinds of weird reasons. You know, like where if there's three things in a row, like if I see okay, there's three bottles yeah. in a row. Me and you don't even have to know each other, and I say, hey, grab the third bottle. It's kind there's a sure there's a kind of an ambiguous understanding. Okay, the one the furthest one on the right. You right. know, it's like that, so the numbers can jam you well, up. Well, we numbered this podcast. Yeah, because it's like chronological. Yeah. So, but interestingly, sense. they could have had just names. Yeah. In fact, maybe they should have. Remember when the UFCs yeah. used to be numbered? Yeah. Or, or they wait, still are, but they're they, numbered. And then they, there's Oh, no, no, what it now. was? This is what I was thinking. They used to give them a number, and then they would have like a crazy name. Yeah, yeah, the title. I <laughs> like that. Vengeance of, the, actually, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Vengeance yeah. of Glory or whatever. <laughs> and then they just started just calling them the names of the guys that were fighting. Yeah. Which makes sense once you have, that's kind of what I'm thinking right now, like someone that's looking for a certain episode, yeah, they they would they might not remember the number, but they remember the book or they remember right. the person. Yeah, that's kind of so, interesting. So we kind, of, but we do kind of do it like that. Yeah, yeah kind of, book, kind of. But yeah, I wonder what is is there value to having a number aside from keeping account of how many episodes yeah. there are? Well, I think I think someone now can if you know what one you're looking for and then you find it. Yeah. Then you can go and find it easy in oh, your yeah, platform. Huh? Yeah. But the remember. easiest way, if you want to know what, because sometimes I don't remember what a particular. If you Google Jocko podcast and then whatever thing that you're looking for, yeah. it'll take you to the YouTube video. Right. It'll take you to the YouTube video. Yeah, because the YouTube videos I put the. Somebody the just told me on on somebody said, "Hey, you should review this book, yeah. Maurice Strategicon." Strategicon. Strategicon, yeah. yeah. And I said, he said, you should review this book. And this guy's like been in the game for a while. And I said, you should check out podcast. And I didn't remember what number it was. So I mm. Googled Jocko Strategicon and I found 57. Boom, done. Boom. <laughs> so now you can say 57. It's easy to go back in there and look, right? Yeah. Check. All right, talking about drilling the troops back to the book. The younger soldiers and recruits went through their drills of every kind every morning and afternoon, and the veterans and most expert regularly once a day. Length of service or age alone will never form a military man, for after serving many years, an undisciplined soldier is still a novice in his profession. (laughs) by practice only can be acquired agility of body and the skill requisite to engage an enemy with advantage especially in a close fight but the most essential point of all is to teach soldiers to keep their ranks and never abandon their colors in the most difficult evolutions thus men thus trained are never at a loss amidst the greatest confusion of numbers The recruits likewise are to be exercised with wooden swords at the post to be taught to attack this imaginary antagonist on all sides and to aim at the sides, feet, or head, both with the point and edge of the sword. It sounds, I think some of those movies Mm -hmm. that came out, because it doesn't sound glorious, to me, maybe it doesn't to you, but to me, that sounds awesome. Mm. And then, like movies like Braveheart, where they're mm. showing kind of the sword battles yeah. and how just psycho it was. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good reminder. Yeah, <laughs> big time. Back to the book. In short, both legionary and auxiliary troops should continually be drilled in cutting wood, carrying burdens, passing ditches, swimming in the sea or rivers, marching in the full step, and even running with their arms and baggage so iner- so that, inured to labor in peace, they may find no difficulty in war. For, as the well-trained soldier is eager for action, so does the untaught fear it. In war, discipline is superior to strength. But if that discipline is neglected, there is no longer any difference between the soldier and the peasant. The old maxim is certain that the very essence of an art consists 
in constant practice. Yeah, discipline is superior to strength. This is a solid book. The art, the very essence of an art consists in constant practice. So whatever it is you want to be good at, yeah. that's how you get good at it. Leif and I just wrote another book. We've been writing a lot. I've been writing a ton. Sure. And you can see the first draft was probably five times better than our first draft of our first book. And, you know, we both have done a lot of writing in the military, you know, in college and all that. But mm-hmm. you practice, you get better. Yeah. Jiu-jitsu, guess what? You practice, you get better. Yes, sir, you do. Pull-ups. Are you good at pull-ups? Do pull-ups. Here we go. The Lacedaemonians made war their chief study. They affirmed to be the first who reasoned on the events of battles and committed their observations thereon to writing with such success as to reduce the military art before considered as totally dependent on courage or fortune to contain to certain rules and fixed principles. As a consequence, they established schools of tactics for the instruction of youth in all the maneuvers of war. How worthy of admiration are these people for particularly applying themselves to the study of an art without which no other art can possibly exist. Boom. (laughs) That's interesting. Mm. It's interesting. Can you imagine it? Well, for me, you know, actually, I can't imagine when you're a kid, you think like war is just like, ah, just charge. Mm. And then as soon as you get into the teams, you're like, oh, there's maneuvers you can do. There's mm-hmm. things you need to make happen. There's yeah. ways you can get advantage. It's not just, what they call it? Courage or fortune. It's not just that at all. Yeah. There's a whole lot of things involved. And it's also interesting that they were doing, they were doing studies and debriefs on the war, on the battles. Because mm. it sounds like people weren't, he says, hey, look, they were the first who reasoned on the events of battles and committed their observations thereon to writing with such a su- success to figure out that there's a military art. And how, you know what, how fired up is it that to study this art of war without, without which no other art can possibly exist? Mm-hmm. Too strong for you? Uh, yeah. I don't too know. Strong I, I know Charles. <laughs> too strong. I can see it. That's a bold statement for sure. It's a real bold statement. I don't think I've thought about it enough to offer any sort of an opinion yeah, you know, yeah. on the deal. But hey, man, I dig it. Kind of like kind of like exercise in life, right? Or health in life. Yeah, that's true. You know. uh, but yeah, sure. Cool. You seem pretty fired up about I it. I am very fired <laughs> up about that. <laughs> yes, you do, sir. And this is where George Washington's statement kind of paraphrased from back to the book he therefore who desires peace should prepare for war he who aspires to victory should spare no pains to form his soldiers and he who hopes for success should fight on principle not chance no one dares to offend or insult a power of known superiority in action Do you get bummed out that you didn't learn this in third grade? Like this whole thing? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right? Including jujitsu for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I I feel like, and you kind of, I learned this kind of from you in the beginning, mm-hmm. where you know how you have this kind of big picture kind of mindset, mm-hmm. right? Like the, the long game. Mm-hmm. You're always like, you used to always correct me when I have this like short sighted. Yeah. Uh, that's what I wish I understood slash even I don't know if kids are even capable yeah. really but well, no you're 100% right and I've actually said this many times that kids have a hard time connecting what they're doing now yeah. with where it puts them in the future yeah and I, sh- I say kids and by kids I mean me everyone yeah I mean yeah. I'm better now yeah but when you're when you're a kid like it made it and Kids, some kids are different, you know, like some of my 
some of the kids that my kids hang around with, some of them are dialed. Yeah. Where they've just got a vision, they know where they're going, they know where they're going to be in eight years, they know what they want to do. Mm. That's not a majority of the kids. Most yeah. kids are, you know, like, well, hey, I can get this right now. Right. And that's cool. And they don't think about how it's going to affect them in the future. And that's, that's, that's just really problematic. Yeah. Not understanding that long game is really problematic. And I think we do a bad, ta- a bad job of teaching it mm. as parents and as teachers and as a society yeah yeah agree uh, well i mean there's because you have you know like jp says this and and Leif said this where when i they, they're like when i was a kid even you say you wanted to be some sort of a commando yeah at least you had like an idea you know so there was at the very least somewhat in your mind to be like hey oh, for sure if i no, do this that was that was a savior yeah so I think some families just through tradition and stuff like that, they'll have that structure. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you're a, I don't know, you're a Johnson. So yeah. you do yeah. this X, Y, Z. And it's just a matter of getting the kid to embrace that, which is really kind of like either they do which or they no don't. Small task, and, yeah, by the way. I mean, it, I, I think if you're fair to your kids, because I think a lot of times like we get caught up in like our own feelings, you know, in this thing, like, what, you know, I don't know, your kid's not listening to you or something like that. You're like, Oh, my kid's not listening to me. You know, you get caught up in the feeling that emotions. Yeah, you know that rather than hey, you know that's this is a problem that needs to be solved kind of thing. So, I think that's the way you can alienate your kids real easy, and it's a common thing. I think where you know we'll alienate our kids, and then they won't embrace the 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 pride and tradition of your family no. because they're like alienated. You alienate yeah. them in one way or another. Sometimes you don't even know that you alien. You know, they're like, oh, he's in a rebellious phase. You know, like, sure, there is such thing as a rebellious kind of phase because, yeah, yeah, you know, certain sure. kids, they gather this or they gain the sense of, like, empowerment in certain ways, you know, so they want to test it out. They want to yeah. test the boundaries well, they, yeah, and all that. They, I, I and subconsciously it. they know they got to break away from their parents at some point yeah. and they got to start practicing that. Yeah, it seems it seems natural. But if you have successfully alienated your kid, when that rebellious phase comes, they're stepping right outside the yeah, game. They're yeah. starting their own thing. In fact, they'll, they're going to have some resentment against dad who's this unfair tyrant who's lame heaps this isn't it stuff funny though, on how me? like the kids never think their parents know anything i know man. you know <laughs> as a parent i understand why i totally do yeah. i'm like oh i, I get it yeah. now but that is funny that yeah. is really funny actually i mean we just don't it's not just parents like your teachers don't know anything i'm not speaking for everybody but like when i was a kid yeah. parents didn't know anything teachers didn't know anything i knew everything bunch of dorks bunch of idiots <laughs> God, I'm stupid. So if you're listening to this and you're, you know, under the age of 40, you might want to listen to your. All right. <clears throat> That's good stuff. He who desires peace should prepare for war. Remember that one. Back to the book. An army too numerous. So now he's talking about the size of the army. The, an army too numerous is subject to many dangers and inconveniences. Its bulk makes it slow and unwieldy in its motions, and it is obliged to march in columns of great length that is exposed to the risk of being continually harassed and insulted by inconsiderable parties of the enemy. The encumbrance of the baggage is often an occasion of its being surprised in its passage throughout difficult places or over rivers the difficulty of providing forage for such numbers of horses and other beasts of burden is very great besides the scarcity of provisions which is to be great carefully guarded against in all expeditions soon ruins such large armies where the consumption is so great that notwithstanding the greatest care in filling the magazines, they must begin to fail in a short time, and sometimes they unavoidably will be distressed for want of water. But if unfortunately this immense army should be defeated, the numbers lost must necessarily be very great, and the remainder who save themselves by flight too much disparated to be brought to action again. And I read that whole thing so I could read this, which is saying, hey, like, you get too many people. I read that whole thing so I could read this. The ancients, taught by experience, prefer discipline to numbers. Like, we'd rather just have a small, squared-away group than a ton of guys. So where I see this with businesses, this is what businesses, is as businesses grow, it becomes harder for them to turn, 
right? It gets harder for them to pivot. Oh, yeah, yeah, make moves. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. So, huh? so you get big companies that when they were small, they were all agile and they were making things happen and they could yeah. change direction. And then as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they lose the ability to do that. Yeah. And so you got to pay attention to that. Yeah. And what you have to do, there's a couple solutions. It's like the solution is, yeah, you can stay small, but you don't want to stay small as a business because you can't, just like, you know, it's cool to stay small as an army, but there's only so much you can do with limited yeah. number of people. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to start to become more aware of what's going, what's going, what's coming down the pipe in the future. Because mm. it's going to take longer for you to pivot this, this big yeah. monster you've got. Yeah. So you've got to do it. You've got to pay more attention. So when you grow in size, this is classic. When you grow in size, a a business, if the leaders of the business continue to focus down and in to the company, they won't see what's coming over the horizon. And that's when they get caught off guard and now they don't have time to pivot because they're a lot bigger. But they used to get away with it because they were a little small company. They could come right. into work on Monday and they could talk to everyone in one sitting and everyone gets on board and we move forward. Mm. You fast forward that and you go from 50 employees to 500 mm. that are now you know, spread out over a large geography. You can't make that quick move. Mm. And so what you have to do as a leader is as you grow, you need to adjust your frame of vision from looking down inside your company to looking up and into the future. Huh. If you don't make that transition, you can't, you, you, you think you can turn things quickly, you can't. Yeah. You can't, it's a big army. And a big army has to be, it's, it's hard to control a big army and it takes more lead time. Yeah, and so that's the focus that you have to adjust to as you grow. Huh. It's, yeah, that's a good way. Of put. So, how do you do it then? Like you, as the well, what you, what just, you do uh, is you point. Yeah, you have people to, underneath you. If you're making widgets, and I was when we started off, we had eight people, and I was in the factory all day checking out your widgets and making sure that they were good to go. And I was testing them myself, and I was making little adjustments. Mm. That's cool. That's fine. It worked when we had eight people, but now when we get forty people, I need to start going. Okay. Echo, can you can you pay attention to the widgets in here? And then when I get to three hundred people, I need to have four or five echoes that are down there that are watching this stuff. So mm -hmm. so that's what you gotta do. You gotcha. gotta adjust yeah. your field of vision, you gotta adjust your focus or else you and what fools people, what fools people, what catches them off guard is that they think they can still pivot quickly mm. because they were able to do it when they were smaller. When they had thirty or forty people, they were able to pivot quickly. They got three hundred, they can't do it. Yeah. And they get caught off guard. You gotta watch out for that. Yeah. Kind of like a big cruise ship, right? Compared totally. to like a little speedboat of or course. something like this. Of course. Those things take miles to turn. Miles. Those big oil tankers, they take miles to stop. Back to the book. The excellence of their discipline made their small armies sufficient to encounter all their enemies with success. Now, this is something else I see a lot in the business world. And this is very common, right? You get the you get the big the big business the big gorilla in the room or whatever, mm -hmm. and they can't pivot very quickly, well then you get the smaller companies that are very agile and they start picking away at the big guy. And that's mm -hmm. what he's talking about right here. Mm -hmm. Like, just because you're small doesn't mean you can't you can't take a shot at the title. Yeah, You know, because you can move quickly and if there's chaos going on, that's when you can adapt. Now, are there advantages to being the big company with lots of money and lots of people and you're very stable? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and are there advantages to being small? Yes, there are. The mistake that people on both sides make is they view themselves, they, they don't understand what their strengths and weaknesses are, and they don't understand the strengths and weaknesses of their opponents, right? Gotcha. So they yeah. say, if there's someone that can move quicker than them, they go, oh, don't worry about them, we're bigger and more stable. Yeah. Well, those people are maneuvering on you, yeah. and they're sticking little needles in your feet, and eventually those little needles get infected, and there's a problem. Yeah. Got a you know, situation going on. So you have to constantly as a leader, and again, this is why leadership is important, you have to, as, as a leader you need to assess what's the strength of that group, what's the weaknesses, what is what are our strengths, right? We keep hearing this again over and over again throughout all these ancient military leaders. Know yourself, know your opponent, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, for sure. People fail to do that. Yeah. Problematic. Hmm. Here we go. Uh, famine makes greater havoc in an army than the enemy and is more terrible than the sword. You know, I, every time I, we've read that in the last couple books, people talking about how it's better to starve your enemy. Mm. It just makes me really, really thankful that there's abundant food in mm. this country right now. Yeah. It really does. I mean, I, I've never been starving and 
can you imagine starving to death? It's got to be absolutely heinous. Yeah. Worse than the sword, according to Vegetius. An army drawn together from different parts sometimes is disposed to mutiny. And the troops, though not inclined to fight, pretend to be angry at not being led against the enemy. Such seditious dispositions principally principally show themselves in those who have lived in their quarters in idleness and effeminacy. These men, unaccustomed to the necessary fatigue of the field, are disgusted at its severity. Their ignorance of discipline makes them afraid of action and inspires them with insolence. So, you let your... It's one of those... It's one of those dichotomies that's what it is if you let your people do whatever they want they get soft and then they start to rebel you want to talk about kids you know let your kids do whatever you want or whatever they want and see how that works out for you lack of discipline with your kids you're gonna end up with some rebellious kids yes now am I saying that you need to beat them like a dog into (laughs) submission no I'm not saying that at all because you know what that dog is that dog's crazy that dog will bite you at some point yep Right? Or somebody else. Or, or somebody both, else. Yeah. yeah. It's problematic. So you have to find the balance between those two things. He says there's there's several remedies for this evil. <laughs> Let them be constantly employed either in the field days or in the inspection of their arms. They should not be allowed to be absent on furlough. They should be frequently called by roll and trained to be exact in observance of every signal. Let them be exercised in the use of the bow in throwing missile weapons and stones, both with the hand and sling and the, and with the wooden sword, sword at the post. Let them be, let all this be continually repeated and let them be often kept under arms until they are tired. Let them be exercised in running and leaping to facilitate the passing of ditches. And if their quarters are near the sea or the river, let them all, without exception, be obliged in the summer to have the frequent practice of swimming. Let them be accustomed to march, march through thickets, enclosures, and broken grounds, to fell trees and to cut out timber, to break ground and to defend a post against their comrades who are in an endeavor to dispossess them, and in the encounter each party should use their shields to dislodge and bear down their antagonists. All the different kinds of troops thus trained and exercised in their quarters will find themselves inspired with emulation for glory and eagerness for action when they come to take the field. In short, a soldier who has proper confidence in his own skill and strength entertains no thought of mutiny. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, these guys were doing force-on-force training. He's saying, look, you're not going to use swords, but you're going to go against each other with your shields Mm. and fight for it. And... And this is something, I've, I've answered that question a bunch of times where people, you know, how do you build morale in your team? It's like, make them train hard, make them work hard. Mm. Now, the real trick is to make them train hard, make them work hard, but at the same time, what you do is you give them ownership of that training so they're running the training. Yeah. They come up with the ideas and you just respect the hardcore training that they're, that they're doing and you mm. do it with them. Yeah. You don't just impose, it's different than just imposing on the team, like, we're going to do this hardcore training. Th- th- that will create a mutiny if you're not careful. Yeah. Especially if you're not out there doing it with them or if you don't explain why it's important. Yeah. I read this thing, this is to kind of add to that. Well, I think so anyway. They, the thing, I what was it? I forgot what it was, but it said, and allow for success. So, like, when you train, you know, you train hard, train hard, train hard, but yeah. allow for success. For sure. Because if there's no success, it's like morale goes down after a while or whatever yeah. or something like this. For sure. You can't just, just, I just said, you can't beat that dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You exactly. can't beat that dog. It is much more to the credit of a general to form his troops to submission and obedience by habit and discipline than to be obliged to force them to their duty by the terror of punishment. So he's making, uh, the reason I pointed that out is because it's making a clear a clear delineation between discipline and punishment yeah. like discipline good punishment bad and he's yeah. saying those are two kind of opposite things huh. so I think that's very important I think so too yeah. and it's important to remember that you're treating your people good yeah you're taking care of them that's what you're doing mm. 
and you don't necessarily take care of them by making their life soft you take care of them by making their life disciplined and hard not to beat them down there's right. a balance yeah. but that's what you got to find yeah back to the book it is essential to know the character of the enemy and of their principal officers whether they be rash or cautious enterprising or timid whether they fight on principle or from chance and whether the nations they have been engaged with were brave or cowardly so again know your enemy you must by no means venture to lead an irresolute or diffident army to a general engagement for soldiers unused to fighting for a length of time must be considered in the same light as recruits so he's saying if you got people that haven't fought in a while and they're a little bit nervous then you got to figure that they're just like recruits you can't always trust them and then he talks about the general and says if he finds himself in many respects superior to his advers- adversary he must by no means defer bringing on the engagement so if you're in a better spot than the enemy or you can take them go mm. but if he knows himself inferior he must avoid general actions and endeavor to succeed by surprises and stratagems this when skillfully managed by good generals have often given them victory over enemies superior both in numbers and strength so this is common sense stuff if you think the enemy is better than you don't fight him head on mm. that's guerrilla warfare if you think the enemy is bigger and stronger than you, you don't fight him head on. All arts and trades, whatever, are brought to perfection by continual practice. How much more should this maxim, true in inconsiderable matters, be observed in affairs of importance? And how much superior to all others is the art of war by which our liberties are preserved, our dignities perpetuated, and the provinces and the whole empire itself exists. You don't really like that. You're suspect. I, I think you, you like it enough for both of us, Okay, sir. okay. We'll take that. <laughs> it's true, though. Yeah, actually, I can dig it. Yeah, but. I mean, let's face the facts here. If if it wasn't for if it wasn't for war, well, then you'd just be enslaved by someone. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love for it to not be that that for that to not be the case. Yeah, but if it wasn't for war, you would just be enslaved by people, uh, yeah. someone else that would someone that believed in war right. would you'd be the slave of them. Yeah. that's how it would work. Yeah, you're. I, I, I'm you're sorry. Right. Like I, I'm sorry, that's 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 the nature of the world. Yeah, no, no, you're you're, that's the way it works. you're actually right. Yeah, yeah, because it's like it's like the hope or wish that everyone was just perfect. Of course, you know? that'd be great. Or uh, actually, in a way, would it be great though? You know how like sure, it'd be great. Everyone got along. Everyone I, singing kumbaya. I don't know, but, but isn't isn't like stress or imbalance or whatever? Isn't that the catalyst for any kind of progress of any kind? What but if we, everyone was just happy and it's just all good. Satisfied. Yep. Right. I don't know, man. I think we'd be in the Stone Age I still. think it's bad. Yeah, we probably would be. Yeah. But guess what? If we're in the Stone Age and I see that you got a piece of whatever, a piece of meat or a rock that right. I want, guess what? I know, but I see That's that. That's going to go down. But now you're talking reality. Yeah, see? of course. So, but, so uh, I mean, I guess the question is, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but the question is, would you want it to be all peaceful all the time with no progress? Would you want that? Good God. theoretical question. Kind of no, right? I mean, because you're kind of thinking that <laughs> you're kind of thinking you like doing graphic design on a computer, which wouldn't <laughs> exist if it wasn't for war. Nope, it would not. There you sir. go. All right. Point taken. But even like, even like competition, right? You know how it's like, yeah, competition is good. Healthy competition is good. It's yeah. good for you. It makes you be. It doesn't feel like that in when you're in the moment. It's like, let's say you're just dominating. And whatever I don't know so you're, you you play tennis I don't know and you're killing everyone you're mm. number one you're breaking world records you're money and then you kind of notice this new young hungry guy coming and he young starts buck. breaking your some of your records you're like you don't like that yeah, that makes you kind of mad you kind of wish that never happened in but at the same time that usually is a catalyst for you to start working harder sure and preparing for that young I'm buck. all about it yeah so but I you're kind of con- and you like the the head to head, you know, like you like that. Yeah, I like the competition. Yeah, you like directly though. You know, like when you say when I think anyway, when when 
they say healthy competition is good. It's the result of healthy competition is good. You get the best products, True. right, in the market True. or whatever. True. And that's the result. That's why it's good. That's why it's kind of empirically good ultimately. Right? I agree. Sure, it's not a perfect You've process. You know? <laughs> you know, I know you're on the fence. But I know. But, but you, you like, like if I came up and you could tell I was feeling good, that would make you, that wouldn't make you nervous. You'd be happy. You'd be like, you like that head to head. Wait, I felt you were feeling good about what? Come on, let's face it. In, on the mats. Oh, on the mats of yeah, justice. Yeah. yeah if yeah. you come up to me and you're all excited. Yeah, yeah. Or give even me the, give me the Echo Charles scowl. <laughs> yeah. There, but it, okay. Yeah, 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 I'll, yeah. Put, I'll put it more yeah, accurately because right, I'm. I, I just played that through my mind. Yeah. When I see you like that, I'm like, oh. Yeah. Okay. Th- it's even more on and. So I'll even put it more accurately, more extreme, more understandable as far as what I think you're like. So let's say we went and rolled and I tapped you out, right, for the first time. Mm-hmm. Sure, you wouldn't like you wouldn't like that specific thing. Mm-hmm. But when we roll again, that's when you'd be at your happiest right there. That's what I think. Mm. Like, I think most of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you you, you want more of a challenge. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, the th- it's really on now. That moment to you is a very pleasurable moment. It's what it seems like. For some people, like, from, I don't know, I would even argue for, like, a lot of people like that. I mean, maybe that's th- a good example, maybe not. But that moment usually is a very stressful moment. Like, dang, I, now I got to deal with this now, you mm. know? And sure, it'll result in the way better stuff, for sure. But the moment is less embraced you, by a normal, yeah. normal person. And you know what I, I think, think people people should pay attention to, too, is the thing that bothers people, again, topic we've talked about before, the thing that bothers people is the anticipation of the situation, right? Yeah. But most people, like you, like we were talking about you making videos earlier, when you know like there's a muster coming and you're probably like, oh, I got to do this video, that I would imagine hangs over your head more than when you actually are, all right, now you're doing the work and you're putting it together and it's right. getting dialed. Yeah, that's true. That's how I feel about things. You know, I'll be like, there's something that I got to do and I'm like, it's like, it's like, oh, you know what you do? You attack that thing. Yeah, just jump in. Yeah, and that's true. Now, when you talked to me earlier about working out and like, hey, do you ever just call it? Yeah. What I will do, which is major weakness, is... I'll I'll like I'll like wait I'll 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 pace I've I've posted this on yeah. Twitter before like yep I hemmed and hawed I yeah. I re I you know redid the weights I vacuumed the mats whatever I'm taking all kinds of reasons to not start yeah. I'm procrastinating it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna make myself do it yeah. but I'm just I'm just like being such a baby yeah, bro, that's and, so funny bro. Yeah. bro i do that too 100 percent. yeah it's like i mean i'm not talking hours yeah but it's there but it, 20 minutes you know 20 minutes of like you know what i better stretch out a little yes bit more. yeah let me, let me yeah yeah exactly yeah. that that's weak that's good <laughs> weak do it right? yeah just do it that's the thing cool. that you know what you know what that's one thing i'll tell you too little this is a workout tip from jocko day right. you do you put a stopwatch on stuff yeah. right like you even when I'm doing something that's not really, <coughs> even when I'm doing something that's not really focused on the time, mm-hmm. I at least put a stopwatch on it so that I just gotta keep, you know, you just keep, it just keeps it on pace, man. Yeah. Because otherwise, that feeling that I just talked about uh-huh. will will start finding itself in between sets. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah that's that not sense. good. Yeah, I'll, um, it's a weird thing, but I mentioned this workout that I started a long time, never really deviated that much from it. It's, it has rest between sets as part of the workout, the time. Designated times. Yeah. Designated time, yeah. yeah it was always, Smart. I don't think, man, I, it is, I cannot think of a time where it ever worked out where the time between the sets was just like ambiguous or something. It was always a specific time. So that little procrastination thing would creep up between exercises or yeah. or before my oh, first set. You yeah. know when you warm yeah, up yeah, and you're yeah, like, oh yeah. my God. And the first set's usually the heaviest for me too. So I'm like, all right, all right, and I'll, that'll happen. But you're right though. Like Put if a stopwatch you, on it. I have this one workout that I do where I do like it's L sit pull ups and then tuck pull ups and then dead hang pull ups and then kipping pull ups and then chin ups. So it's like those five, and you do as yeah. many as you can in each, and then you then I do something else, and then I come back and do it again. I do like five rounds of that. So they're like burnout sets. Yep, each boom, one's boom, a burnout boom. set. Okay, and l- l- like the first time I did, it, I was like, oh, that was cool. And so when the first time I did it, you know, I was kind of. Um, Let's just say motivated to do it. You yeah, know, it was yeah, kind of fired cool. up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this was years and years ago. Mm. And then the next time I did it, it took me a really long time. 
And I realized because I just was taking a long time between sets. Yeah. Like that's not the purpose of it. Yep. So now I always put a stopwatch on that thing. Yeah. Keep 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 the clock ticking. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and you feel it because you feel the clock ticking. Yeah. You know you're like oh my god, I guess that that would apply to everything, huh? Mm-hmm. Like you like if you um. Uh, you know that's why like when I write I do a thousand words you yeah. know why because I get a thousand words done in an hour sometimes I try, I'm, I'm always shooting to see if I can get it done in 50 minutes uh, wait wait so you well, let's say when you write you mm-hmm. boom you set the clock your t- your watch uh, I don't set my watch yeah, but, but, I, you but I, I look at it I look at it go it's uh it's you know 848 gotcha. okay 948 I'm gonna be done yeah I'm gonna wrap this I gotta I'm do not that. Gonna because that's even worse you sit there and stare at a blank screen or you click on that little on that little uh, internet browser <laughs> thing at the bottom, <laughs> then there you slope. go. You're yeah. going down that slippery slope. Don't yeah. do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Check. Talking about the general a little bit more. If therefore he finds his army composed of raw troops, or if they have been long on long been unaccustomed to fighting, he must carefully study the strength, the spirit, the manners of each particular legion, and of each body of auxiliaries, cavalry, and infantry. He must know, if possible, this is good, he must know, if possible, the name and capacity of every count, tribune, subaltern, and soldier. He must assume the most respectable authority and maintain it by severity. He must punish all military crimes with the greatest rigor of the laws. So there is a dichotomy there. He's saying you should know the name of every single person on your team. Mm. At the same time, if they get out of line, you maintain by severity. Mm. For troops that have never been in action or have not for some time been used to such spectacles, been used to such spectacles, are greatly shocked at the sight of the wounded and dying. And the impressions of fear they receive dispose them rather to fly than to fight. That, again, to me, is how do you train people and get them used to what they're going to be facing in the real world always keep that in mind as a leader and i was about to say almost keep always keep that in mind as a trainer but as a as a leader guess what you are you're the trainer yeah having explained the less considerable branches of the art of war the mil the order of military affairs naturally leads us to the general engagement so now he's up to this point he's only been talking about how to get ready for war This is a conjecture full of uncertainty and fatal to kingdoms and nations for indecision in the decision of a pitched battle consists the fullness of victory. Troops must never be engaged in a general action immediately after a long march when the men are fatigued and the horses tired. The strength required for action is spent in the toil of the march. What can a soldier do who charges when out of breath? Sure, everyone's gonna hit me up. See, you need more rest. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to a little, a little get after it right here. The sentiments of the troops should be determined before battle. It is necessary to know the sentiments of the soldiers on the day of the engagement. Their confidence or apprehensions are easily discovered by their looks, their words, their actions, and their motions. No great dependence is to be placed on the eagerness of young soldiers for action, for fighting has something agreeable in the idea to those who are strangers to it. So he's saying the young soldiers that haven't been to war, that are all fired up to fight, don't listen to them. Because there's some agreeable in the idea of fighting to people that haven't done it before. And then he says, on the other hand, it would be wrong to hazard into an engagement if the old experienced soldiers testify a, disclin- a disclination, a disinclination to fight. So if the, if the old guys are like, hey, this boss, not a good idea, mm. pay attention. Mm. A general, however, may encourage and animate his troops by proper exhortations and harangues, especially if by his account of the approaching action he can persuade them into the belief of an easy victory. 
With this view, he should lay before them the cowardice or unskillfulness of their enemies and remind them of any former advantages they may have gained over them. He should employ every argument capable of exciting rage, hatred, and indignation against the adversaries in the minds of his soldiers. Now, this is something I disagree with. Mm. I disagree with this idea. I disagree with the idea of telling the troops that it's gonna be an easy victory. Mm. Of telling the troops that, hey, they're cowards. I don't agree with that. Mm. And because when you do that, there's a lot of things that can go bad. Mm. Uh, Number one, when you go against the enemy and you face them and they start doing good against you because they're more skilled than you expected, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it can jam up your morale. Oh, right that can moment. jam up your morale really bad. So I don't recommend ever disrespecting the enemy. I recommend you give them, not to mention, if hey, this can be an easy victory, what's your mindset going into it? Yeah, yeah, cruising. I mean, first of all, you're not training hard for it. You think you're going to win easy. It's called, yeah, don't do that. Mm-hmm. No, you, you, you respect the enemy. I think the point that he may have been trying to make is like, don't be afraid of the enemy. I get that. Yeah. Nothing to be afraid of, yeah. but respect him. Mm-hmm. Didn't Frederick the Great say something like that in last last time? Like something about remind them of how lame they are or whatever. Um, he did say something like that, and actually, it just the thing that he was saying. What was it that he said? He he was saying no. What he was saying was. Only talk about the enemy with total scorn. Right, right. That's okay. what he I was remember. saying. Only yeah. talk about the enemy with total scorn. And actually, he was also saying, like, you shouldn't even hate the enemy, but don't let anyone know that you don't hate yes, them and yes. despise them, which was kind of interesting. And <laughs> yeah. he's saying the same thing, like, rage and hatred and indignation. Yeah. That's how you want them to be thinking of the enemy. So they both agreed on that point. Yeah. But I disagree on the point of tell, the, tell your men that this is going to be an easy fight because it's not going to be an easy fight. Yeah. Back to the book, it is natural for men in general to be affected with some sensations of fear at the beginning of an engagement. But there are without a doubt some of a more timorous disposition who are disordered by the very sight of the enemy. To diminish these apprehensions before you venture on action, draw up your army frequently in order of battle in some safe situation so that your men may be accustomed to the sight and appearance of the enemy. When opportunity offers, they should be sent to fall upon them and endeavor to put them to flight or kill some of their men. Thus, they will become acquainted with their customs, arms, and horses. And the objects with which we are once familiarized are no longer capable of inspiring us with terror. It's amazing how good you get at something like if you've seen it one time. Yeah. You know, and just, just mm-hmm. think about any situation. Think if... If, like, if you scare someone, which I enjoy scaring people, sure. <laughs> but if you scare someone and then they come back in and you try and do the same thing, yeah. like they're not scared at all. It yeah. doesn't work. Uh-huh. So, so, so that's what that's how you want to prepare your people. You get them used to those seeing what they're going to see. Yeah. Good generals are acutely aware that victory depends much on the nature of the field of battle. When you intend, therefore, to engage, endeavor to draw the chief advantage from your situation. The highest ground is reckoned the best. Always take the high ground. Talking about reserves, the method of having bodies of reserves in the rear of the army, composed of choice infantry and cavalry, commanded by the supernumerary lieutenant generals, counts, and tribunes is very judicious and of great consequence toward the gaining of a battle. Some should be posted in the rear of the wings and some near the center to be ready to fly immediately to the assistance of any part of the line which is hard pressed to prevent its being pierced, to supply the vacancies made therein during the action and thereby to keep up the courage of their fellow soldiers and check the impetuosity of the enemy. So always have reserves. Don't overextend yourself. The post of the commander-in-chief is generally on the right between the cavalry and the infantry. For from this place, he can best direct 
the motions of the whole army and move elements with the greatest of ease wherever he finds necessary. It is also the most convenient spot to give his orders to both horse and foot and animate them equally by his presence. So position yourself in a good spot. An able general never loses a favorable opportunity of surprising the enemy either when tired on the march, divided in the passage of a river, embarrassed in a morasses, struggling with the declivities of mountains, when dispersed over the country they think themselves in security or are sleeping in their quarters. So just take advantage of your enemy whenever they let their guard down. Mm. In all these cases, the adversaries are surprised and destroyed before they have time to put themselves on their guard. But if they are too cautious and you and give, t- but if they are too cautious to give you an opportunity of surprising or ensnaring them, you are then obliged to engage openly and on equal terms. So whenever you get the chance, you you sucker punch them. Right? You know, is that the, is that, am I encouraging you to go out and sucker punch people? No, but if you're going to fight, take advantage of the situation. You've already determined that the enemy needs to be fought. You're going to do everything you can to. But isn't that. You think think I just started a rash of sucker punches? No, I I feel like you misused the expression. That's what I think. Because sucker punch is more of a waging of war. Or a certain level of war when someone. So is you're saying this is the, these are already at war. They're already at war. Understood. So now it's like it's kind of sucker punch is the kind. Hey, we're just gonna go invade this country. They have no idea mm-hmm. that we're you know mm-hmm. they they I don't know okay. one of their citizens said something bad about our president or something like that. But if you guys are in war and they're sleeping or something like that, oh no, man, that's good. I cool. think I agree. No, I I actually agree with you very much, very strongly. I think you're correct. Yeah. In fact, I don't think you should sucker punch anyone. Yes, I agree. You shouldn't sucker punch someone, but if you are at war with someone, yes, then you All try you and get them at their least prepared situation. Yes, agree. A thousand percent. All right, this is important. The flight of an enemy should not be prevented, but facilitated. Generals unskilled in war think a victory incomplete unless the enemy are so straightened in their ground or so entirely surrounded by numbers as to they have no possibility of escape. But in such situation where no hope remains, fear itself will arm an enemy and despair inspires courage. That's powerful. Yep. Think about that. Fear itself will arm the enemy. If you surround them completely when men find themselves oh sorry when men find they must inevitably perish they willingly resolve to die with their comrades and with their arms in their hands the maxim that a golden bridge should be made for a flying enemy has much been commended for when they have free room to escape they think of nothing but how to save themselves by flight and the confusion now you might think that you might think by that statement he's saying hey like you build a golden bridge for them to get away yeah you might think that that's sort of a a merciful thing to do but yeah. check out this line and the confusion becoming general great numbers are cut to pieces <laughs> The pursuers can be in no danger when the vanquished have thrown away their arms for greater haste. So here guys are dropping their swords. They see an escape. They Mm -hmm. drop their swords and they run for it. But you got them. You're waiting there for them. In this case, the greater number of the flying enemy, the greater the slaughter. Numbers are of no signification. Where troops once thrown into consternation are equally terrified at the sight of the enemy as their weapons. So... That's good advice. And that's, this is something as well, you know, it's not the same thing, but man, when you, when you, when you're dealing with another human being and let's say, let's say you and I are talking about something and I know I'm right and I know you're wrong 
but you kind of planted yourself into it. You kind of painted yourself into a corner. Yeah. I'll give you a little out. You yeah, know, yeah. I'll give you yeah, a little yeah. out. <laughs> you know, I don't want to like. I don't want to do that to you. Yeah. And I don't want to do that to people <coughs> I work with. No, yeah. I'm gonna give you a little out. Like, oh yeah, it's probably the way it used to be. But you know what? Hey, you know, yeah. just a little something. <laughs> where you go, like, yeah, yeah, you know, definitely. I've done it before. Like, oh, that's cool. I'm glad yeah. it worked. Yeah. You know, what do you think of this? <laughs> <laughs> so it's give good. people a little out. That actually is very, very. Um, it's not. It's a nice thing to do, but. It feels very smart. When, it's the it's way you very said it smart. Right there. It's very smart to do. You give people a little out. Yeah, I have to do that with. I have to do that with. Uh, I have to do with my kids. You know, yeah, give them yeah. a little out because they'll paint themselves in a corner because they're kids. You know, <laughs> that's what they do. They just really. that's what they do. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's a, when you embarrass someone because that's kind of embarrassing, especially when you get into some argument where it turns mm-hmm. into a me against you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Then you realize you're wrong, and you're like, "Oh man, I have to basically yep. get them out." I got yeah, give them give them out. So we're kind of we're both winners, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, it's you know? all good. It's all good because <laughs> my ego's not involved over here. I'm yeah. just happy that we can get along. Yeah. I'm moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I'm good with it. Yep. Back to the book in the first place. Your men must not imagine that you retire to decline in action, but believe your retreat an artifice to draw the enemy in to a more advantageous position for you where you may more easily defeat them in case they follow you. For troops, you perceive their general despairs of success are prone to flight. So what that's saying is, and I should have given this introduction before, is that if you feel like you have to retreat, you don't say, hey, we're, we're, we're getting crushed here and we're going to retreat. What we say is, hey, we're going to bait them. We're going to move back and we're going to draw them in. So the guys go, oh, okay, I get mm. it. If you're just like, hey, we're getting our asses kicked and we need to get out of here, you're going to lose. Yeah. Your people are going to run away. <laughs> yeah. But if you're like, hey, we're doing this maneuver, we're going to fade back a little bit, we're going to set them up. And yeah. people go, oh, cool, I'm going to get an opportunity for payback. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. Yeah. Very good point. It seems like their mindset would still be in the fight in that case. For sure. And then versus, versus oh, we're getting out of here. Yeah. Exactly. You keep them in the fight. Exactly. <laughs> now, once people, once once the enemy is fleeing and you chase them, you got to be careful. Back to the book. A rash and inconsiderate pursuit exposes an army to the greatest danger possible, that of falling into ambu- ambushes and the hands of the troops, enemy troops, ready for their reception. For as in the temerity of an army is increased and their caution lessened by the pursuit of a flying enemy, this is most favorable opportunity for such snares. So when you get somebody running after you, that's when you can catch them. The greater the security, the greater the danger. Troops When unprepared, at their meals, fatigued after a march, when their horses are feeding, and in short, when they believe themselves most most secure, are generally most liable to a surprise. All risks of this sort are to be avoided carefully, and all opportunities taken of distressing the enemy by such methods. So, that mindset that people get, like you just said, when they're running away, is one thing, but also when they think they just won, yeah. they get the mindset of like, oh, we don't need security anymore, anymore right now. We don't need it. We're good. There's that one little line. The greater the security, the greater the danger. That, that line right there doesn't make any sense. The greater the security, the greater the danger. What he's saying is, when the, the greater the security is, the greater the danger of being susceptible to Letting your guard down. Mm. Yeah, like if well, That's like in statement. an MMA situation, they got the guy. Da- you remember oh, that sure. fight, right? We talked about it before. But yeah, you got them days, days, and they're like, "Well, I'm, I'm gonna go yeah. in for the finish, all crazy." Yeah. Not like as cautious as maybe they should be. Kind of that situation. Yeah, for Is sure. He's talking about. Yeah, okay. the greater the security, so the better you feel. Right, this, your sense the, of security. The, <laughs> I keep losing that line. The greater the security, the greater the danger. The yeah. greater the security, the greater the danger. That's what it is. Gotcha. So when you're feeling secure, watch it. Watch yourself. <laughs> Resources in case of defeat. If while one part of your army is victorious, the other should be defeated, you are by no means to despair, since even in this extremity, the constancy and resolution of a general may recover a complete victory. 
So just because you take a little loss doesn't mean you're going to lose completely. Yet notwithstanding an entire defeat, all possible remedies must be attempted since many generals have been fortunate enough to repair such a loss. So you can always come back. An army after a defeat has sometimes rallied, returned on the enemy, dispersed him by pursuing an order, and destroyed him without difficulty. Nor can men be in a more dangerous situation than when in the midst of joy after victory, their exultation is suddenly converted into terror. So, same thing. You're joyous because you won, and all of a sudden, you're, the tables turn. Whatever be the event, the remains of the army must be immediately assembled, reanimated by suitable exhortations, and furnished with fresh, fresh supplies of arms. That's what you do. When you get a good victory, you're like, all right, reload. That's yeah. what we're doing right now. And in this last section of the book, he, he, he kind of just breaks down and sums up the rest of the book that mm. we just read. Mm. So these are all pretty familiar. Most of them, because I covered most of them. It is the nature of war that what is beneficial to you is detrimental to the enemy, and what is of service to him always hurts you. That seems like common sense. Yes. The more troops... The more your troops have been accustomed to camp duties on frontier stations and the more carefully they have been disciplined, the less danger they will be exposed to in the field. Train them hard. Men must be sufficiently tried before they are led against the enemy. Train them hard. It is much better to overcome the enemy by famine, surprise, or terror than by general actions. For in the latter instance, fortune has often a greater share than valor. I like the idea of overcoming the enemy just by terror. (laughs) Just, just, I I wish there was like a, a full chapter about that. That's legit. Those designs are best which the enemy are entirely ignorant of till the moment of execution. Opportunity in war is often more to be depended on than courage. To debauch debauch the enemy's soldiers and encourage them when sincere in surrendering themselves is of a special service for an adversary is more hurt by desertion than by slaughter. So if you can get the enemy to like come over to your side, Mm. that's even worse to the enemy Mm. than when you're just killing them. Mm. Because you think about it, when you're getting your friends killed, you have some kind of vengeance. Yeah. But if they just take your friends and they're like all in the, in the back room having a, <laughs> having a glass of wine, with, you know, you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna, that sounds better than the deal I got. <laughs> it is better to have several bodies of reserves than to extend yourself too much to the front. There you go. A general is not easily overcome who can form a true judgment of his own and the enemy forces. Mm. We've been hearing that one since Sun Tzu. Art of war. Valor is superior to numbers. The nature of ground is often of more consequence than courage. This guy's talking about terrain. That's Mm. what he's talking about. So everyone that's in the military listen to this right now. Terrain, terrain, terrain. Learn to read the terrain. This is a good one. Few men are born brave. Many become so through care and force of discipline. Great dichotomy there. Mm -hmm. Care for your people and through force of discipline is what makes people brave. Mm -hmm. An army is strengthened by labor and weakened by idleness. Don't sit around. Don't sit around. Keep moving. Troops are not to be led to battle unless confident of success. Novelty and surprise throw an enemy into consternation, but common incidents have no effect. Learn new moves. (laughs) That's some advice I need to take. I always do the same moves. Not good. He... 
who rashly pursues a flying enemy with troops in disorder seems inclined to resign that victory which he had before obtained. So if, if you go pursuing the enemy when your troops aren't organized, you're basically trying to give away your victory. Mm. So be careful when you pursue. An army unsupplied with grain and other necessary provisions will be vanquished without striking a blow. Man, I, I need to, we need to find some. I looked around, I've been looking for like a, like a Roman soldier and they have to find some letters and stuff. Mm. But these guys must have been hungry. What are you talking okay. about, though? I'm talking about the <laughs> hunger. Yeah. On finding the enemy has notice of your designs, you must immediately alter your plan of operations. Mm. Check. Consult with many on proper measures to be taken, but communicate the plans you intend to put in execution to few and only those of the most assured fidelity, or rather, trust no one but yourself. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting, consult with many people. Yeah. Get some feedback from everyone. Next, punishment and fear thereof are necessary to keep soldiers in order in quarters. But, in the field, they are more influenced by hope and rewards. A little dichotomy for you. Mm. Good officers never engage in general actions unless induced by opportunity or obliged by necessity. To distress the enemy more by famine than the sword is the mark of consummate skill. And this is actually the last one here. Dispositions for action must be carefully concealed from the enemy lest they should counteract them and defeat your plans by proper expedience. So those, again, I didn't cover all the maxims. And the reason I didn't is because some of the maxims that he talks about are are legitimately ancient war, tactical warfare. But it's worth getting the book so you can read those and understand them. And he... He kind of ends this book with a a little note to the Emperor of Rome at the time, and this is how he wraps it up. How glorious it is, therefore, for your majesty, with all these qualifications to unite the science of war and the art of conquest, and to convince the world that by your conduct and courage, you are equally capable of performing the duties of the soldier and the general. I think that's actually a a cool statement to end on, capable of equally performing the duties of the soldier and the general. So he wraps up the book with that last dichotomy. And I think that's one of the, really one of the most important qualities for a leader to have. And one of the most important qualities to be able to balance, and that is to be able to maintain and lead from the highest position and at the same time never forget where you came from Mm. right you've heard that expression don't forget where you came from that's what he's talking about and I think for every leader what that means is recognize that you still have more to learn that you can still grow you can still try and get better and obviously that's what we're doing here is trying to learn and trying to keep learning sure and I think that wraps this up and obviously we make this podcast so that we can learn and other people can learn if they want to join in and if you learn anything and you want to you know give this podcast some support support. there's some great ways to do it and the goal to when you support the podcast is that you also support yourself. That's 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 the goal. Yep. Mutually supporting situation yes. is what we're going for. So first off, we got our company up in Maine, up in New England, Origin USA, in Farmington, Maine. One hundred percent American made products. Products. It's a jujitsu company first and foremost, right? That's mm-hmm. the foundation. Sure. Geese. Yes. And rash guards. Interestingly, geese, one of the hardest things in the world to make from scratch. Mm. And we make them here in America. Sure. A lot of people think they're the best. 
That's yeah. actually what I think. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so it depends on what you mean by the best. So if you think that the ones that fit the most appropriately for jujitsu, mm-hmm. then yeah, they're the so best. So if you're going to use your jujitsu gi for jujitsu, then they're the best. They're the best. Concur. If you want various different weaves, various different options that happen to be made in America and various perfect blends for washing, drying, antimicrobial stuff. You know. And yeah, they're the best. Yeah. When you see, do you remember the first time you saw Dragon Weave like with your own eyes? Yes. Were you impressed? <laughs> <laughs> I was. Yes. Yeah, so. Like it's legitimately, <laughs> it's, it's legitimately Impressive. I actually, this is the, one of the dumbest things I've ever thought of in my life. All right, lay it on me. When That's I good. first saw Dragon Weave, mm. I thought to myself, it would be cool to get a legit, because you know sometimes I got to wear a suit because I'm going to work with a company or something. <laughs> I thought to myself, it would be cool to get a legitimate suit made out of this. Dragon that Weave cool. suit. Dragon Weave suit. Uh-huh. Yeah, I now, can see that. it took me about 20 minutes before I realized I was an idiot, but it's that cool looking. Yeah. Yeah. So and and, question, and, yeah. and it's that practical. That's the thing. Yeah. So, anyways, you can get geese rash guards, originmain.com. What else? Joggers. Sh- well, okay. So you wanted the sh- the suit. Sorry, bro. You said it. Yeah. So uh, you know, let's let's talk about it at least a little bit. You said the suit. The suit, dude. You know, okay. You know, hey, forgive me. Dragon weave suit. Gra- Good, forgive cool. Me. <laughs> but so they had. I've talked about this before. Where my favorite shorts are dragon weave shorts. Yeah, they were. Something. They don't make them. Sorry, not yet. Well, so I was talking to Pete about him, mm-hmm. about him, and I was like, hey, you know, like you should make the dragon weave suit shorts. Mm-hmm. And I forget why, but you know, not not now. There's other shorts which are actually could prove more dope. <laughs> Check. You see the button, like you saw the buttons, right? Like for the yeah, shorts, yeah, yeah, there are yeah, these yeah. buttons. Oh, they're dope. Anyway, yeah. so yeah, there's there's some joggers, some you know, some shirts and whatnot, some regular apparel, more athletic wear, but um, super comfortable. I'll tell you that. As the the self slash whatever proclaimed connoisseur of comfort, I can say this is, a, of comfort. This is the most Echo comfortable struggles. stuff you're ever gonna put on. If you find anything more comfortable, let me know. We'll see. Compare apples to apples, but yeah, some uh, some good stuff there. Also, some supplements. Mm. And you know, speaking of so, so you know, you know who Dr. Rhonda Patrick is? Yes, she's been on Joe Rogan a couple times. Yeah, probably even more than that. Anyways, she just tweeted out sure. this thing talking about curcumin. And all right, well, what like, is it? Like no kidding, double what blind, up? triple whatever. Sure. Tests UCLA, um, curcumin is awesome for you mm. and but do you remember like what is, yes what, you know uh, this is this is the thing it, it, it blew off the article actually blew off wouldn't you blew off like, like it was like yeah curcumin keeps down inflammation oh, like that was gotcha. no big deal right right and actually that's a huge deal yeah that's yeah. why that's one of the reasons why it's in joint warfare <laughs> yeah. but then they did like a test and it improved memory and like cognitive reaction 28 percent this is in a, a lab. Yeah. So, and then they referred to people in India mm. that people in India who have a high level of curcumin in their diets, mm-hmm. that's why Indian food looks yellow, huh. is because of that. There's, well, not just like direct, but they're saying that's a really uh, interesting fact, right? Yeah. So, sure. anyways, that's in there. It's in joint warfare. So it's in joint there's warfare. There's more than just joint warfare. Yeah. The super krill, which yeah, is krill true, oil, true. as we all know by now, krill oil is pretty much the best source of omega 3. Better than fish oil. Yes. And we all know fish oil is good. <laughs> krill oil is even better. Super krill oil. Even better than regular krill oil. You know oil. what? The big difference between super krill oil and krill oil? I do, actually. Yeah, it's super. <laughs> no, but there's in some actual yeah. technical beneficial super stuff. And it's like Zen it's something, but it's an antioxidant. No, 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 it's like xanthine it's xanthinum yeah, 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 or something. Uh, sorry, I'm saying it wrong. But it's an antioxidant, which is a big deal. You know what rust is? 
rust. Rust. Yeah. It's yes. oxidation. Yes. That's all that is. Yeah, yeah. Oxidation of metal. Mm-hmm. So when you, because some people, I did, well, I knew this for a long time, but before I knew it, this is what, I, you know, this is how my brain was as far as antioxidants go. My mom was like, hey, antioxidants. I'm like, wait, oxidants, oxi- oxid, oxygen, oxygen is good. We're like, why is it antioxidant kind of mm-hmm. thing? But it's like, no, it's not antioxidant, antioxidant, meaning it fights oxidation, which is rust of your body. So your body technically is kind of rusting, mm-hmm. you know, antioxidants keeps it from rusting. I so like, now like that it. you, uh, when, you hear, when, you hear, when you hear, when you hear antioxidants, that's what you're hearing. It's going to keep your body from rusting straight up. Good. So krill oil, omega threes, better uptake than fish oil. Um, and we need omega three, many things. Just know that you need them for, in this case for your joints, in other cases for your eyeballs, your brain, your <laughs> organs, all this stuff. But. Know that just know that it has many uses. Plus antioxidants, boom, super krill oil. That's what makes it super. Then joint boom. warfare, as we mentioned, yes, that's for your curcumin. joints. Curcumin, not just curcumin. No, glucosamine chondroitin. Mm-hmm. These are things for Stack. cartilage. Man, <laughs> I'm telling you, if you have bad joints, boom, joint warfare, <laughs> boom. Uh, get some discipline too. But yeah, by the way, and so now what we have, as it turns out, according to Dr. Rhonda Patrick, as yeah, you said, yeah. we have, like so they all play stack. into each yeah. other. Yeah. Just getting after it. So joint warfare krill oil is the joints, but joint warfare also has cognitive enhancements, yeah. which as does di- the discipline. So the there D. you go. Discipline is like a, what do you call it? A powdered drink? That's what it is, right? Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, and you mix it up, you put a little in your water bottle. And, yeah. then, and then it gives you a little bit of that. Yep. It gives you that mental edge, uh, mental Dave advantage. Burke, uh, Dave Burke sent me a text. He said, quote, best quote from the last podcast, Dave Burke is like a crackhead with, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. No offense. Yeah. I know you just like the discipline. Yeah. Hey, man. Did you but- see someone posted a picture of like... A guy with like cocaine powder all over his face. <laughs> yeah, the Dave Chappelle situation. <laughs> yeah, that's a good Dave Burks on the. Yeah, uh, got any more of that discipline? Got any more of that discipline? <laughs> cool, yeah. cool. Also, Mulk. Okay, so that's a little bit of a shifting gears scenario in regards to supplements. Mulk. Okay, I'm gonna say the word protein. I said this before. I'm gonna say it again because to me it's appropriate. I'm gonna say the word protein powder, but I'm not gonna say, "Hey, Mulk is a protein powder." I'm not gonna say that. It's not. A, it's not appropriate. Because no. it's different. This is how it's different. It's milk. <laughs> I just had a guy hit me up uh, and he said, I don't drink protein powders, but it sounds like this is just dessert. Yeah. And I hate to say it, it's kind of true. <laughs> it kind of tastes like that too. But yeah. dessert kind of has this like kind of guilty kind of feel yeah. to it. This yeah, no is guilt. guilt-free dessert. Here's what I did, though. I was pushing, though. I know. And I, I was going to kind of let you know, but I was like, eh, you know, it just let me just have it be funny for me. So I'm thinking, literally thinking of milk while I'm shopping. Yeah. Okay. So when I shop, you know, you, when you, I, don't, I don't know how much you shop, but. Zero. Okay. okay so I go in. Next question. <laughs> I have my go-tos, right? I get red leaf lettuce. You eat a lot of red leaf lettuce for whatever reason. And. I get milk. But this time, I'm thinking of the milk. I don't know why. It was just in my head. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going to go drink some milk at that time. It was just in my head for whatever. And my eyes shifted to chocolate milk. So I'm like, hey, what if I mix the chocolate milk oh, with God. the milk? I know, right? It might be too much. Did but you do it? No, I didn't no, do it. Don't yet. do that. You don't need to. Then again, why would I knock it before I try it? Because what if I discover something? <laughs> See what I'm saying? That I didn't do it yet. Nasty. I'll report back. But nonetheless... It is like a dessert, but it's one of those beneficial desserts. Yeah, that like, will not taste Kind of like good. dark chocolate. Like, you know, you know, mm. consider dark chocolate, mm. right? I mean, it's a certain percentage, yeah. right? Or something where it's like, good for yeah. you. Yeah. Got to drink enough. So it's kind of like that. It's like a big milkshake. Put yeah. an egg in there. You really want to get nuts. We'll, we'll have some milk for sure at the immersion camp. Yeah. Which is, by the way, August 26th. That's what it is. Last year, we didn't have milk. Milk wasn't even invented yet. Yeah, it, it was like straight up didn't exist. It didn't exist. It mm-hmm. was like then all of a sudden you cracked an atom open, and they had to add milk to the periodic table. Yeah, that just yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. Last year I had to drink. Cho- I was drinking the, just the chocolate milk because they had it at the camp. Oh right, right, yeah, yeah like the the, like the old school cafeteria chocolate milk. Just, yeah. just it's just nuts. It's just horrible. You don't like it? 
No. Okay. I, Maybe, mean, I think I'm no, addicted actually, to the experience because that's what, what it no, had at you. It's not good. It's not good. So, yeah, yeah immersion that. camp. August 26th and September 2nd. That's the last day about those two sessions in there. I would say, uh, you know, I can't speak for anyone else. Uh, I would say, yeah, go to both because that's good. But, you know, go to one, go to two, whatever. For those that are wondering, and I, well, this isn't confirmed yet, but we pretty pretty much had the talk, Pete, me, and, and B Little. And the conversation is looking like wh- morning, gi. Afternoon, no gi. Evening, whichever Your choice. you want. Yeah. That's like a dream, isn't it? I think so, too. <laughs> and I don't have uh, any complaints from the last one. Yeah. I literally, I have no complaints. Yeah. But I do remember thinking, if there was some no gi mixed yeah, in here, this yeah. would really... This would make me kind of not really want to leave. Ever. Yeah, yeah. The, this is worth pointing out. This is the kind of thing that I... You you ever think about, like, people that are OCD? Yes. I think about that all the time. Right. Obsessively. Yeah. Compulsively. <laughs> so, sometimes I have a little bit of that in sure. me. But one of them is, is like, I want uh, things to be squared away. Yeah. Right. And so, when I was going to the camp, I was kind of like, how is this whole laundry thing going to work? Like, what's going to happen? This was before. Yeah. Okay. Well, the thing is, just to let everyone know, if you come to camp, they they do laundry. There's like a laundry service. They pick it up. They pick the it up. Yeah. And they wash all your clothes, and then they bring back in all your clothes nice and yeah. clean. And that's a huge deal. So you think you could basically get away with two geese? Yes. Two geese. Yeah. Well, maybe three. I Yeah. I would say, th- wait, I only yeah, had two. Probably three geese. I didn't bring any geese. I got origin ones oh, yeah. when well, I was bring there. Bring two and buy one when two. you get there. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying yeah. to rotate them through properly, but they're pretty fast on the turnaround. Anyways, yeah. that's the deal. But the, but that's a that's a that's kind of a big deal. The laundry is because there's yeah. a difference between hey, there's a laundry service. Um, walk yeah. across camp to the laundry mat and go handle yeah. your business. Well, and, and actually, the camp is at a different same lake, Echo Lake, layers. but it's a different lake. But and I don't know what the exact laundry service. I think it's gonna be the same exact thing though, because oh, okay. the service didn't come from Camp Last Time. It's somebody that does laundry for oh, geese. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. There should be people in the world that just do gee laundry. Just gee laundry. Just, yeah, they come and grab it though. They knock on your door like room service. Yeah, really, it's yeah. a huge deal. I think it's very convenient, very nice. But yeah, emerging camp August twenty third, August twenty sixth through September second. Two sessions. I'm gonna be there. Jocko's gonna be there rolling. Yeah. Rolling to fulfill your curiosity of how it is to roll with Jocko. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say it'll be a good time rolling with Jocko. I'm not yeah, going to say that. Might let might you be, down. Might, yeah, you might get let down as far as pleasurable experiences go. No, no, no. Hey. Might let you down. Might be, everyone thinks, oh, he's got to be so unbelievable. No, it's like I'm not that good at jujitsu. Yeah, you know? I wasn't really thinking that. I was thinking more, um, oh, yeah, it'll be fun and pleasurable meanwhile oh. it'll be like like 90 percent painful and then like five percent <laughs> embarrassing and you know various other uh oh, negative God. emotions but yeah you can right. you know whatever if if you wonder about that kind of stuff i don't know maybe you don't but yeah that's in origin also we have a store actually jocko has a store and it's called jocko store who made that name up i did <laughs> Keeping it simple. Anyway, this is where you can get the rash guards that we make. Get after it. Little trooper rash guards. Warrior kid rash guards, too, by the yeah. way. For youth. Warrior kids getting into jujitsu, boom. And for surfing and for whatever. Yeah. Running, cycling, all that stuff. Um, and uh, what other rash guards are there? I thought I was going to make it up. Um, I'm going to make T-shirts, too. Yeah. Legit Stand by t-shirts. to get some rash guard. That's what I'm going to make. Stand by to get some. Check. I was going to make a good rash guard, but then I thought, hey, what's the message of good? Isn't, good stand, isn't standby to get some too close to get after it? No. Okay. Because standby, no. Because standby to get some is when you're standing by to get some. Getting after it is when you're actually getting after it. So when you're standing by or you're getting after it, it's two different things completely. Back to the good rash guard is important, I think, as far as the layers go. Okay, good is like when something quote unquote bad happens mm-hmm. there's always some good to, to come from it it's mm-hmm. what you said it's a direct quote so you can't make and put on a rash guard that's based on something bad happening as far as losing goes or something like that right okay I guess you could technically yeah. if it looked dope 
I don't know. Jury's still out. Anyway, back to the t-shirts. There's some cool ones on there, right? Yeah. Just put that def core on the t-shirt. Def. Yeah. Good idea. I think you're you're right about that. Oh, uh, hats on there as well. Two kinds of hats as of right now. Actually, three technically. Three types of headgear. Trucker hats. Flex fit hats. Beanies. Yeah. Just in time for summer. Actually, Beanie's been out for a while. Beanie's was a spring Yeah, like a month, thing. dude. <laughs> Don't give yourself too much credit. But speaking of summer and winter, hoodies. You get hoodies on there, too. Legit hoodies. Non-Hawaiian hoodies. Even or though you're gonna hoodies. make you're gonna make a Hawaiian hoodie, apparently. Yeah, I think technically there's no such thing as a Hawaiian hoodie, but I will have a lighter weight hoodie for when you go to Hawaii and it turns nighttime and the wind the breeze kind of blows and you're like, dang, I wish I had my long sleeve shirt on, you know, and it'll look kind of <laughs> dope. That's what I think. That's my whole approach, okay. in my opinion. There's some women's stuff on there too, uh, you know, for the lady troopers, some tank tops and V-neck type T-shirts made specifically. For the ladies. Solid. Discipline Good. equals freedom. Go down. Also, other ways to support. Another way to support. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. On iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play or wherever you listen to uh, podcasts. Whatever platform you choose to use. Also, YouTube. Yeah. You should subscribe to YouTube. The reason is so you can see Echo's legit videos. For instance, you just re-released one. Thank God. Yes. Echo had made a video for Warpath, and he put Christmas music on Which we on all it, loved. Which it was I, during Christmas time, and we all loved it. It was during Christmas time. And the thing is, the video was so uh, graphically intense, and I, I could tell. And you had actually told me that it took days, days, to put together three seconds worth of yeah. film. And so when you showed it to me, I was super pumped. And then I heard the music. <laughs> <laughs> I was super unpumped. <laughs> unpumped. Yeah, right. I was unpumped. And anyways, he's redone the Warpath video. Now has good music behind it, not Christmas music. We'll just say revised. It's yeah. revised. You know. Thankfully but you know, we can still us. revisit Did the Christmas one. Did you pull off one? the old one? Did you pull no, it down? No, I left it, man. That's for us, you know, folks who like Christmas. <laughs> you know? Oh, the Grinch over here. Yeah, I know, bro. But yeah, it's good. YouTube, yeah, subscribe to the YouTube and uh, leave a review on the on the iTunes thing mm. if you're in the mood. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Leave a review. It's a good one. Good way to support too. Also, if you are looking to improve and increase your supply of fitness gear, I just got a few things for my my bicep brats. You know when you kind of choose to embark on a different type of fitness, mm. you know. You, I don't know. You stick with the same thing. I get it. No, but I do you know. different things. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get fired up. But anyway, I don't want to go into that. But, but I got some new stuff. Anyway, mm -hmm. where you get it is, in my opinion, go to Onnit. So onnit.com slash Jocko. You can get some good stuff on there, including but not limited to kettlebells, maces. I'm going to get battle ropes. I just read some really good stuff about battle ropes. You ever nice. done battle ropes before? I've done them, but not with any kind of regularity. Yeah, yeah. Like I want to I want to do a battle rope program. Yeah, I read, man, I I don't go in too much, but it's like, well, you know, like if you're, it's like for Metcons, mm -hmm. you know, and you can do yeah, a full body, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, it's like it burns a lot of calories, gets you in uh, muscular, muscular conditioning and stuff like that, but really good. I was like, after you read it, it's like you want to do battle ropes from now on. Incorporate. Anyway, go there, on it.com slash Jocko. I got the mace from Jocko today. Mm -hmm. I was fired it's up. It's heavier than you so, thought. Yeah, so and I knew it was gonna be heavy. That's yeah. the thing. Like I know because okay. that's only a twenty pounder. Yeah, and look, you figure. If you're, you know, that's that's one of those things. I think you know when we talk about kettlebells and, and people will say like, what size kettlebell do you start off with? Mm. It, it's hard to narrow that down. Right. That thing is heavy. Yeah. There's not too many people that are just getting all over that twenty pound. Yeah, don't uh, even. Club. This is like too heavy. I've never done a mace workout before. Yeah. By the way, this is too heavy for me. To do like a workout yeah i'm like even even like it's so it looks like a big what do you call not a bowling pin but you know the juggling pins oh, you know yeah, like yeah. the people in the job so it looks like that but it weighs 20 pounds it feels like it weighs like 50 pounds yeah they literally feel heavy. feels like that because it's all big anyway yeah but i'm gonna i'm gonna work it in and i'm gonna report back and i feel that soon i'm gonna be a lot stronger than you son <laughs> i like it that's good yep. speaking of that um if 
maybe you're thinking, oh, instead of working out, I'm going to take a break. You can get the Psychological Warfare album mm-hmm. that has tracks. It's on iTunes, Google Play, MP3, wherever you get MP3s. Just a little bit of guidance on how to overcome situations where <coughs> maybe you're not going to get after it and you know you should. Yeah. So there you go. Working on Psychological Warfare 2 at this time. So. Yeah. That'll be coming in the future. All your excuses are lies. That's yeah. going to be the title. Psychological Warfare 2, All Your Excuses Are Lies. Yeah. See that? Yeah. Look, we just kind of came up yeah, with it. Yeah, right that's now. good. I like how you do that. I'd call it like a spot. Like a spot. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm going to go Psychological bench, spot. Yeah. That's what it is. Because you Can't might call not need it. call it that, though. Because not everyone thinks of... When you say spot, you're thinking of 1994 weightlifting, bodybuilding. Sure. Or no. Powerlifting. Um... Yeah, I guess you can't really yeah. spot on a on a power clean like Olympic lift, yeah. but nonetheless, it is a spot. Nonetheless, regardless of what analogy you want to use, I think the band the spot is the best because you don't need a spot necessarily. Most of the time, you don't need it. Most of the time, cool. But if you got a spotter there and you need the spot, boom, there it is, and he's gonna spot you and he's gonna bring you through. You're not gonna let the bar bury you. You understand? Fair enough. Also, Jocko has some tea. It's called. Jocko white tea, mm-hmm. interestingly enough. Uh, dry tea, which is tea bags and in a can, which I've been popping every day, by the way. So good. I'm not going to say it's an anti-nausea medication. I'm not going to say that. But as it turns out, it's kind of an anti-nausea med- medication. Super refreshing that they can, by the way. It's also anti-weakness because once you drink Jocko white tea, you can deadlift 8,000 pounds automatically. Hey, it's available in Canada too. On Amazon in Canada. That's new. Mm. So check out c- Canadian folks up there hanging out with Jody Minnick somewhere. Sure. <laughs> Ottawa. <laughs> then uh, you can get it there too. Yeah. Also got some books. Way the Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. Those are for children, but I think everyone that reads them gets something out of them. Yeah. So check them out. You there, might like them. That video uh, you did with Brian Rose? Yeah. Right, the London yeah, yeah. one? Um, so my brother's watching the video. Uh-huh. You know, and I don't know why he's all, like, surprised. Like, he's impressed. Of, okay, I get it. But, like, he's all surprised impressed. You know the difference, right? Mm-hmm. You know? So Wait, he's watching part? the video. The, you know how you – basically the part where you were explaining where the work here, part two. Mark's okay. mission, where you're like, okay, this psychological bully, uh, you know, did this thing, and now Mark wants to fight him. He can fight now. He knows jujitsu, so he kind of wants to fight him. So Uncle Jake's like, you know, comes in, and he's all, hey, cool, you can fight him. So I was like, oh, okay, all right, Uncle Jake, you know, getting nuts, whatever. Okay, you can fight him, but first you got to do recon or, or yeah. intel, right? Intel yeah. gathering yeah, or whatever, see what up. And so he does, and he finds out all this stuff, you know, and through, like, finding the stuff or whatever, mm-hmm. he gains, like, a little bit of understanding or mm-hmm. whatever. And so instead of fighting him, maybe you should help him mm-hmm. kind of thing. So it's like this little curveball. It's like, man, it's like kind of taking the high ground when you don't expect to So Jay to Charles kind of like that. He liked that one. He's all impressed. He hadn't read it yet? Impressed with it. No, but I don't hey. let him read that thing. I'm still reading it to my gr- little girl. That's Jack. It's up. kind of the ethos, right? The way of the worry kid ethos. You just read it. You just mm-hmm. keep reading. When you're done reading it, you read it again. Start all over. Yeah. Yeah. She likes it. She liked the paper mache pumpkin yeah. situation. She yeah. really liked that part. Yeah. So that was actually pretty funny. Yeah. It was good. It and also of humor shining through. <laughs> oh yeah. Big time. <laughs> also the field manual. Mm-hmm. Discipline equals freedom field manual. Best book ever written. Best book physically to look at. Yeah. My opinion, yeah. black on black. Boom. What do you think of that front cover for t- f- uh, photograph? Do you like that? Yeah, yeah. It's very so? iconic <laughs> uh, photograph. <laughs> Check. Um, yeah, that's a good one. That's uh, it's like, what do you call it? like a manual for? If you make it a manual for life in general, mm. I think you'd be on the good path right there. I agree. I agree. If you need a manual for some leadership, you got mm. extreme ownership. That's the book that I wrote with my brother Leif Babin, and it's about combat leadership and how you can apply the lessons that we learned on the battlefield to everything you do in your business and in your life and in your relationships with people and also coming pretty soon actually is the follow on to that book that I also wrote with Leif the dichotomy of leadership it is you know you you've hear, heard us talk about dichotomy all the time it's actually the last chapter of extreme ownership and this is the trickiest thing about leadership is trying to balance this dichotomy so we talk about it and 
do a deep dive and get granular on how to balance the dichotomy of leadership in that book, which is titled The Dichotomy of Leadership. You can pre-order it right now. It comes out September 25th. If you don't want to get a copy when it comes out, then don't order it now and you won't get one because <laughs> it's going to sell out and the publishers are slacking as usual and they'll be like, well, wait, wait, there's probably a, you only know, we'll print on a few of these because you know, we're not sure. Yeah. Numbers. Their projected numbers are off. Mm. Always. And you want to get the, um, you want to get the first edition. That's mm. my opinion. So do that. And for all, for, for leadership training on site, beyond the books, beyond the podcast, I have Echelon Front. It's our, leadership consulting company we solve problems through leadership also we have the muster which is a leadership conference there's only one more this year it's in san francisco muster 006 it's october 17th and 18th you have to register for that at extremeownership.com every muster we've done is sold out this one will sell out to and also for current military, law enforcement, border patrol, firefighters, paramedics, first responders, we got the roll call 001, September 21st in Dallas, Texas. It's a focus one day leadership training seminar for people that are in uniform handling stressful situations. And you can also register for that at extremeownership.com. And until we are live at the muster in San Francisco or at the roll call in Texas or at the immersion camp in Maine. Until then, if you want to cruise kind of hard with us, we are on the interwebs on Twitter, on Instagram, and yes, on that Facebook cable. Ah. Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And thanks to all the people in uniform out there, military, police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, border patrol, all first responders, really. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without you doing what you do. So thank you for protecting us and taking care of us. And also thanks to your families who support you while you support us. And to everyone else. Everyone else, thanks for listening. And remember what Vegetius said. That it isn't just size or numbers or even courage itself that will ensure victory instead it is exact observance of discipline that is what it takes that is what you need so go out there and get after it and until next time this is echo and jocko out